In this organic chemistry video, we are going to focus on elimination reactions. So what are elimination reactions? They happen when a small molecule such as water or HCl is lost from an organic molecule such as an alcohol or a haloalkane and we're forming a carbon-carbon double bond. So the product of this reaction is an alkene. One thing that we should notice when we're classifying reactions, so this is called elimination and we're losing a small molecule, which means we can get a little bit confused between elimination and condensation reactions. So a condensation reaction is shown at the bottom here. And what is happening is two organic molecules. So we have two molecules here, an alcohol and a carboxylic acid, and they are joined together to make one larger organic molecule, in this case an ester, while losing a small molecule in the process. So that is different to what's happening in the elimination reactions, whereby we're removing essentially an atom from each side, a chlorine and a hydrogen, or a hydrogen and an OH, but instead of joining two molecules together, we're joining two carbons together that were already joined together in a double bond. So an elimination reaction is the opposite of an addition reaction. And we should be able to see this from the balanced equation. If you reverse that equation, that is basically the same as an electrophilic addition. So the type of functional groups that can do elimination reactions are haloalkanes and alcohols but they require different conditions. So we'll look at both of those reactions separately and we'll also have a look at the mechanisms. So first of all, we'll look at elimination from a halo alkane. So what do we need for this reaction to happen? We need a source of hydroxide ions such as potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, but the solvent in this reaction is also really important. So you should already know that if we were to use hydroxide ions in aqueous solution, then this much more common reaction, nucleophilic substitution, is going to occur. And the OH- is just going to go in and attack the carbon and swap places with the Br- and the product is going to be an alcohol. So that's a substitution reaction and not an elimination, and that happens in aqueous solvent. So for elimination to occur, the potassium hydroxide needs to be dissolved in an alcohol solvent such as ethanol and there must be no water present. The reaction is also heated under reflux and the balanced equation would look like this. So the hydroxide ion is removing a hydrogen ion to form water and then we are also losing the Br minus. Now this only happens remember in ethanol or another alcohol solvent. This reaction is much more likely to happen with tertiary haloalkanes. If you have a primary haloalkane, it's much more likely to undergo substitution. So it's not 100% about the solvent, it's also about the haloalkane that you have. Alcohols can also undergo elimination reactions. So the small molecule that's being lost in this reaction is water. And so it's often referred to as dehydration. In order for this reaction to happen, then we need to heat it and we also have to have a concentrated either sulfuric or phosphoric acid catalyst present. Now this reaction is actually reversible. The reverse reaction is known as hydration. So you may have done stuff about the hydration of ethene. Not always using the same conditions because we tend to get our conditions to favour which side of the reaction we actually want to happen. So if I wanted to actually react ethene with water, I would use steam and I'd probably be using a transition metal catalyst and high pressure. So just like with the haloalkanes, this reaction is much more likely to happen with tertiary alcohols. And that's because the mechanism happens via a carbocation which we'll look at in a moment when we look at the mechanism for alcohols. Let's now look at the mechanism for the conversion of a haloalkane to an alkene 
using potassium hydroxide dissolved in an ethanol solvent. So not every exam board actually requires you to know this mechanism by heart. But in my experience, examiners often use unfamiliar examples to test your knowledge of mechanisms. So it's a good idea to just be familiar with what's going on in case it comes up in a different context. So we have our hydroxide ion and as usual with a mechanism, we've drawn our lone pair and the negative charge is on the side of the oxygen because that's where the negative charge is. And just like any other mechanism, I'm also going to make sure I include the dipoles or the relevant dipoles, which is the CBr bond, because we know that that's going to break during this mechanism. Now, most people are really familiar with the breaking of that CBr bond because it happens in nucleophilic substitution. But notice where I've drawn the hydroxide ion. It's not over by the carbon. And I've done that deliberately to kind of avoid the temptation in this reaction, the hydroxide ion is not going to be attacking that delta plus carbon. That would be happening if it was nucleophilic substitution. Instead, the hydroxide ion is acting as a base, by which we mean it accepts a hydrogen ion. So what it's actually doing is we're going to draw the lone pair of electrons going towards any of the hydrogens on that left hand carbon. So not the carbon that is next to the bromine. So we're taking off a hydrogen, but we're taking off H plus to go with OH minus to make water. That means we're leaving behind the electrons in the bond between that carbon and that hydrogen. Now we're not gonna have a negative carbon. That's very unusual to happen in a mechanism. So instead, we know we're making a double bond. The electrons from that carbon hydrogen bond are gonna move in between the two carbons. Now that's going to leave the carbon on the left with two hydrogens and a double bond. But the carbon on the right, we're going to need to lose something. And of course, we're going to lose the bromine because we know that that bond breaks quite easily. And that's it. So there are three arrows all happening at once. We are left with a double bond from where the electrons have moved in between the carbons. Carbon on the left just has two hydrogens left attached to it carbon on the right also has two hydrogens so we've made ethene we've also made h2o from the hydroxide ion reacting with the h plus from the molecule and we've also got a br minus a bromide ion as well so most importantly what the hydroxide is doing here is acting as a base it's not a nucleophile because it's not bonding to a delta positive carbon it's bonding to H+, so it's a proton acceptor, and it's being a base. What about the mechanism for alcohol to alkene, our dehydration reaction? Again, this is not explicitly required by every exam board, but it is one of those things that comes up a lot as a sort of example mechanism. Now, you may have noticed in the balanced equation for this, the acid is a catalyst. And the reaction happens the same way, whether or not we use sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid. So really, it's only the H plus, the hydrogen ions from the acid that are important in the mechanism. And because it is a catalyst, we know that the hydrogen ions have to be regenerated at some point. So this has got a few more steps to it. We're going to think about lone pairs. Lone pairs are really important, of course. There's no dipole that we need to worry about, and that's because we're not breaking a bond at the start of this reaction. What we're doing, in fact, is making a bond between the lone pair on the oxygen of the alcohol and the H+. And this is only going to happen under these conditions of very concentrated acid. Normally, alcohols don't react with H+. So in this case, it's the alcohol, the OH group itself, that is behaving like a base by being a proton acceptor. We then get an intermediate in the reaction. So at this point, the oxygen is still attached, the two hydrogens attached, and of course, the carbons have not changed at all in terms of the hydrogens that are attached to them. What has changed is this oxygen now has a positive charge. Remember to think about atoms that have the wrong number of bonds in a mechanism as being the ones that have a charge. So if my oxygen has three bonds here, the norm for oxygen would be two. 
that's where the charge has ended up. And what that means is you can see that there is effectively a water molecule, but with a positive charge attached to the carbon. And so what can happen is this is very easy to lose. Water is, of course, a really common molecule, so it's a common product of a chemical reaction. When we lose this water molecule, we're going to end up with a carbocation. We've seen those before as intermediates in electrophilic addition reactions. We have a carbocation. We're going to make water has been made that has no charge on it now and that's because the electrons from the carbon oxygen bond have gone over to the oxygen and that's left that carbon with a positive charge. We know we're going to be making an alkene so we need to be giving electrons back to that carbon. We need to be losing something positive from the molecule in order for it to lose its positive charge and of course the other thing we need to do is get our hydrogen ion back that is catalyzing the reaction and we can show all of this with one arrow you will see that that is really similar to that first arrow that we drew or the second arrow sorry in the previous mechanism that is the loss of an h plus this time it's happening because of that carbocation on the right hand side whereas in previous times it was happening because the hydroxide ion was removing it this time we don't need to show anything removing that negative that positive hydrogen ion and we just end up with that and of course our H plus is left over so that is our hydrogen ion from the catalyst and it's been regenerated water molecule has been lost so in the balanced equation we don't need to write the hydrogen ion at all because it gets used up in the first step and then it gets lost in that second step Finally, let's just have a look at possible isomers that can result from elimination reactions, because this is a really common exam question. So elimination reactions can result in structural isomers. The previous ones that we've been looking at in the mechanism, we've just been looking at haloalkanes or alcohols with just two carbons. So there's only one option of where the double bond can end up. So let's see how it looks different with 2-bromobutane. So we know that during the reaction, the bromine needs to be lost from the molecule. And we also know that we need to lose a hydrogen atom from the adjacent carbon. But in this situation, there are two possible adjacent hydrogens that we can take away, which means that we are going to get structural isomers. So if we were to take away this hydrogen here, along with the bromine, then we'll have a CH3 group at the end. We'll have a double bond between the middle two carbons. There'll be an H here, the bromine will have gone and there will be a CH3. Whereas if we went with removing this hydrogen, we would have a CH3, the CH2 would stay the same this carbon would have the bromine removed, and then this end carbon would have one hydrogen removed. And so the two alkenes that we've made are butyrene on the left and butyrene on the right hand side. However, there's even a little bit more to it than that. So these are the two structural isomers. They have different names to each other, but 2 and but one They're positional isomers where the position of the carbon-carbon double bond has gone. But if we look carefully at the structure of but 2 if we look at that double bond, there are two different groups, H and CH3, H and CH3, on each of the carbons of that double bond. And that means that but 2 also has stereo isomers or geometric isomers and so we can also have different versions of butyrene they're both called butyrene of course but the one on the left that i've drawn here would be my z butyrene and the one on the right would be my e so it has to be one of those. So in theory, there are three possible isomers that can form but one z but or e but 2 
Now you may have learned in other situations like electrophilic addition that there are rules like Markovnikov's rules about like carbocation formation and therefore which structural isomer you get. With elimination, we don't really have any of these rules. So you shouldn't be asked any questions about which one is more likely to form, but you could definitely get questions about the formation of those isomers.